The Lord be with you. And also with you. As always, it's great to see all of you out there. We especially welcome those who may be watching us online this morning. And if you are a guest of the house, we especially welcome you. We dearly hope that the your time that you spent here would encourage your life and your faith. If you want more information about our faith family, please raise your hand and our ushers will make sure that you get something to read along the way. So if you want more information, raise your hand, otherwise we'll move on. Lots of announcements? Well, not a lot, but some. Okay. So again, today, uh, Bible study is at 9.30 in the yellow rooms down the hall. <clears throat> encourage you to come and join us as we kind of walk through the lessons that are being read today so that you have a better understanding of where they're coming from and why they're written. Sunday School for Kids is down in room 4, all the way down the back hall, and youth group in room 6. So all of that happens at 9.30. Plus, of course, coffee and fellowship in the, in the, in the uh, fellowship hall. Uh, hurricane relief items are still being received, as in the back end of the narthex, as you can see. Once again, you've proven yourselves to be an incredibly generous group of people. So our youth group and a couple of their adult advisors, Jeremy Baldwin and Bobby Gutshaw, uh, we're here helping to begin to pack up those things in the kits that were asked for, uh, whether it's in Appalachia or in Florida. So uh, those things are still being received. Uh, we're still putting them together, and uh, we'll get those out of here as soon as we can uh, get all of them put together. So uh, photos are being taken in the narthex today if you are one of the new members who's coming into the faith family. Uh, new members will be received next Sunday in both services. We are excited to uh, receive brothers and sisters in Christ into this, uh, into this assembly. Uh, if you're in that category, uh, we appreciate your willingness to have a, your picture taken so that people can begin to understand who you are. Claire, are you here? You would. There's Claire with the camera. How about that? <laughs> Claire with the camera. That sounds good. <laughs> Anybody wants a new photo for the ah, True. <laughs> and if you don't like the photo of yourself that's up on the board, you can get a replacement done. This is how we work here. So please see Claire. Uh, Kathy Holstrom, of course, our sister in Christ, died uh, several weeks ago. Our memorial service will be held next Saturday here and the usual scenario visitation at 10 with the family, service at 11, and then a luncheon at 12. So I encourage you to come and because of, of that memorial as we remember one who was dearly a sister in Christ among us. I'm asked to announce that Sand Dollars will meet on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and so I hope you know who you are. I think that's enough. Jerry, and inquire if you will.
before you should be now. <laughs> Thank the choir and the assembly of voices here. And if you were able to stand, I invite you to do so as we begin our praise of a gracious God. As always, we make our strong beginning in the name of God the Father and of God the Son and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the writer of First John reminds us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment of silence to reflect on how we've been living our life in these last several days. Let us then confess our sin to God our Savior. Most of us, God, God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may abide in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you. And for his sake, forgives you all of your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I with great joy declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of that sin. By the cross of Christ, they are remembered no more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the procession of women. from above and for our salvation. 
salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people. Second Sunday in the ordinary time and season of the church. Take us back to the Old Testament to the prophecy of Isaiah. This particular section is what's called the fourth of the servant songs. Four little snippets that appear throughout the prophecy that speak about God sending a suffering servant whose suffering will redeem the people of God. People weren't quite sure what to make of that. Believers who live on the far side of the cross believe this was perfectly fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And as you listen now to these words that were written 700 years before he was born, see if it doesn't sound like the script on Good Friday that Jesus carried out for us. These are the words from Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, <coughs> yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet 
two of his generation protested, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was signed a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the letter written to the Hebrews, one of those small books that kind of been buried in the back of the New Testament. Not quite sure who wrote it, but it's pretty clear it was written to people coming out of a Jewish background, a Jewish understanding of faith and life. And so the imagery of the high priest, one who would advocate with God for the people. And the writer intends to show how Christ is like that high priest, the ultimate high priest himself the priest, and himself the victim for us. These are good words to remember in us as well. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts 
and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. St. Mark, the 10th chapter beginning at the 35th verse. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, well, you will indeed drink the cup I drink and, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left, it's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. we confess our faith in this Christ in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From the rest, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the singing of the song.
God's grace, God's mercy, and God's kindness rest deep. Deep in your minds, deep in your hearts this day and always because of Jesus Christ our Lord. The text is the gospel lesson that was read just a few moments ago, so far in the text. Have you ever had a taste of something that was so good that you immediately wanted more of it? In fact, you wanted it all. You didn't care about the calories, you didn't care about who was watching, you just became obsessed with it until it consumed you. Well, in a way, that's kind of what affirmation is like. The word affirmation comes from the Latin words affirming to strengthen. And indeed, that's what affirmation does. And when people begin noticing what you do, or you get promoted at work, or one whom you love finally loves you back, that's the first taste of affirmation. And at first, well, it's a little difficult to get used to. This is not what you expected. And yet, there's that deeper self inside of you that says, this really tastes good. I think I want more of it. When the hard work you put into a relationship, a job, or a membership is finally recognized by others, the voice inside of you says, finally, it's about time. And it feels so good, especially if it's deserved. But the curious thing about affirmation is that Less is more, and more sometimes is not so good. More affirmation, affirmation can simply begin to affect the way you think about yourself, the way you think about other people. That's kind of what happened, evidently, to James and John in our text. They were the sons of Zebedee, and so they were born fishermen. Their life career script was mapped out before they were even born. It was very simple. Get up in the morning, go fish, sell fish, smell like fish. That was it. Nothing more than that. And then one day, this itinerant rabbi came walking by and said, come follow me. We don't know what possessed them to do it, but they did. You can imagine Zebedee kind of sitting there and scratching his head, like, what's he going to do now? We'll have to change the sign from Zebedee and Sons Limited to Zebedee Limited. <laughs> but John and James then began to follow Jesus, and their life was never quite the same. They saw things they had never seen before. They learned things they had never learned, never learned before. But perhaps the most notable change was in how people began to treat them. Jesus' reputation as a good teacher, miracle worker, preceded him wherever he went, wherever he went, whatever town, whatever city it was, great crowds of people crowded in that wanted to be near him, and by default, near those who were close to him. So James and John were no longer being asked about the price of fish. Now they were being asked about what Jesus said and what it meant, as if they were suddenly theologians. That little taste of affirmation began to grow. They followed Jesus loyally, and then they began hearing him speak about a new kingdom that was coming. And in their own mind and heart, they began to wonder what their parents would be in that new kingdom couldn't let go of that thought. So finally, with great boldness, and we might say great stupidity, but that's another story, they said they went to Jesus and said, we want you to do a favor for us. How about that for a good spot? We want, when you come into that new kingdom, we want to be on your left and on your right hand side. You read these words and you can only wonder if Jesus at that point just sighed and rolled his eyes. Or perhaps he was just close to tears. 
Either way, once again, he finally had to patiently try to explain to the people who were following him, supposedly the inner circle, that being affirmed in this new kingdom only meant that you flipped and became a servant to all around you. With humility and with gratitude. I don't think that's exactly what James and John expected to hear. And it would take them a lifetime to figure it out. Being a disciple of Christ today involves that same learning. It changes us from seeking affirmation here in the world in which we find ourselves to something far deeper. Our mind is focused not on getting it here, but more on finding what leads to a measure of peace and a satisfied heart that will carry us through this life and into the next. It is hard, however, not to think in the same way that James and John did. Affirmation is like that first bite of something really delicious and you really want more of it and you want it all. But affirmation always comes with more expectations and with new difficulties. If you get to one level, the world always wants you to get to the next. And if you don't, well, you're yesterday, not today. <coughs> it's World Series time again. Who won last year or the year before? How about the Super Bowl? Who won before Kansas City? Juggernaut came along. Who won the Oscars in Hollywood last year? Do you remember? Do you know any of them? Affirmation always comes with a price. And sometimes when you chase it, it winds up being more than we could imagine. And it can indeed affect how you think, how you act. It can consume your life, it can consume your relationships. It becomes sort of a God in and of itself. That's where being a Christian becomes a resource for you. Because the love that Christ proclaims through the cross is indeed affirmation enough. Because it's the only affirmation that will never change. On the day of your baptism, you were labeled beloved and redeemed. On the day you die and take your last breath, you will be labeled beloved and redeemed. Nothing changes. Because that's the standard of what the cross is about. And that grace carries you through this life and into the next. That doesn't make living in this life any easier. James and John certainly found that out. Herod had James killed by the sword on the temple steps in Jerusalem to curry favor with Jewish authorities. And as he was killed, they cut off pieces of his body and threw it off the steps. The first of the twelve disciples to be killed for faith. John, much later, was banished, was persecuted, and ended his life in exile on the island of Patmos. He would be the last of the twelve, and he would be the only one that didn't, that wasn't killed outright. But there's nowhere in Scripture that suggests that either James or John ever changed their mind. From the moment they said yes to following Jesus, they boldly followed him. They leaned on his affirming love through this life and into the next. All the affirmation that we receive, certificates of order, trophies we hold, bonuses we cash are all very nice in the moment and they ought to be celebrated. I'm not trying to minimize that. We work hard for these things and it's nice to have somebody recognize that. But that's not where life, peace, finally comes from. In our baptism, we are called to be like James and John. Leaning on grace alone, 
and finding our strength therein. Because beyond all of the stuff we may get here is the ultimate affirmation of the love and being of God for now and forever. And in response to that, we live and we serve with grateful hearts, you know, you're not just a nice thought, but a mindset, a lifestyle. It certainly catches the world by surprise. They're not sure what to do with us, but the world has never been quite sure what to do with Christians. But we know enough to know we're on the right path and we're doing the right thing. And in the process, our heart is satisfied and peace comes. May that be so in your life and in mine. Let the people of God say, prayers in the service, and we are bold to believe that Jesus' words when two or three are gathered, that he is here in the midst of us, and we believe that and trust that and lean on that. In our prayers today, obviously, we're praying for the world beyond these doors, a place where there is great conflict, great restlessness. We also pray for the country in which we live and which we love. We also pray for the church that it might be persistent in its affirming Christ crucified and the affirmation that comes from that. We also pray for many people in our minds and on our hearts. Specifically today, we pray for Tara Tesha, daughter of Dale Jamal, still going through diagnostics. We pray for Willa Jones, going through back surgery on Tuesday of this coming week. We pray for Gay, uh, gay Gerardo Mello, probably pronounced Bernard, forgive me for not pronouncing that right, friend of Willa Jones, heart surgery, 
Carol Wilson, friend of Estelle Stevenson, ongoing diagnostic, diagnostics. We also pray for Hazel Gillespie, who will be going through uh, more treatment in the near future. We pray for Noretta Burke, who is beginning chemotherapy. For Ed Brown, who should be released from rehab tomorrow. And also for uh, Doug Braden. We pray for all of these, and of course, we pray for those who are mourning. We pray for the family of Catherine, the daughter of former member Jean King. We also pray for the friends and family of Rick Strader, friend of Hazel Gillespie. For those marking milestones in life, we pray for Mary Gonda, Helen Marama, Loretta Burke, and Pat Denuncio, and Scott and Kim Stiller. For these and others, we pray. Let our prayers would catch our breath as we step lightly into a new day. The amazing gift of life that lies before us. We pray that you would make us mindful of the miracle it is just simply to be here. Help us never to take a second here for granted. Help us to rejoice in the things that we may discover today that will bring delight. Help us to have strength and faith in the things that will come to us that will challenge us and maybe cause us to scare us. Be with us, Lord. Allow us to lean on your grace and on your firmness that you gave to us through the cross of Christ. And may that be our hope and our delight. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. We pray, O oh God, for the world beyond these doors, a place where there is great conflict, great restlessness. We pray for places where there is war. We pray for places where there are refugees seeking just to live. We pray for places that are recovering yet from the hurricanes in Appalachia and also in Florida. People with so much hurting all around us, oh God. And we pray that the hands and the hearts that reach out to them with compassion and hope may be seen as hands coming from your love and from your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Our prayer. We pray, oh God, for our country, the place in which we live and which we love. We pray especially for ourselves as we go through this restless time leading up to an election. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to listen more than speak and to try to understand more than judge. Help us to wrestle, O oh Lord, with what it is you need us to be and want us to be in this moment, in this time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for the church throughout the world that it might be persistent in its witness to Christ crucified. And we pray that through this, O oh Lord, others may be drawn to your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. We pray for your many people on our minds and on our hearts. We pray especially today for Tara, Tara. Willa, Willa, Kay, Kay. Carol, Carol. Ed, Ed, Noretta, Noretta. Doug, Doug, Hazel. Hazel. We pray, oh God, in whatever place they are in this morning, that you would be with them, and that your love would find them and bring them that peace that the world cannot give. In the midst of wrestling with what is and what's going on, help them to find their affirmation, hope in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Every one of us, O oh God, comes into this room this morning with other people in our minds and on our hearts that are not on this list. People that are known to us, people that are precious to us. We are bold enough in this moment to shout their names out loud, trusting that you do hear and that in your time and way you will answer. And so on this day, we also pray for. In whatever place these loved ones are, oh God, come near to them and give them the hope that comes from knowing that your love is there and our love is there as well. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, oh God, for those who are mourning. We pray for the family of Catherine. The family of Rick. Amen. May their loved ones find certainty and hope in the resurrection promise. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for ourselves, O oh God, as we will come to this moment to celebrate again this mystery that you left for us over 20 centuries ago. The bread and wine and body and blood. Things we can scarcely begin to comprehend. And yet we are bold enough to trust that when we participate in this, as you call us to do, that you are there, and that once again you come to affirm 
to come to bless and to assure us that we are not forgotten and that we are your redeemed and cherished children. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Help us, O oh God, to leave stronger in faith than when we came in this morning. We also pray for those who are marking milestones in life, for Mary, Mary. Helen, Helen. Loretta, Loretta. Pat. Pat. Pat, Scott and Kim. Whatever the milestone is, O oh God, may you come near them. May they rejoice in seeing your fingerprints on their life in the past and knowing that of your promise to be with them in the future. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in that mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And also with you. I encourage you to share that boost enthusiastically with each other. Yes. salutary 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Then with an angel, an archangel, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup of the wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave that to them, saying, Take and drink of this, all of you. This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Just do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we join together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until we all are everlasting. Amen. 
with our lineage peace and for his service. Amen.
the body of Christ in the name of him. Amen. George, this is the body of Christ. It is given for you. Take and eat. indeed the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting depart in his peace and for his service Amen, Amen. I invite you to rise <laughs>
you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. We pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And indeed, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.